All right, good morning. You ready to open up God's Word this morning? So we are in the book of Hebrews, and we have gone through, last week we did an intro, walked through kind of an overview of the book and the first four chapters. If you do not have one of these uh, journal Bibles, raise your hand and one will be brought to you. It's important that you have one. We'll get you a a reading guide. Uh, Here's the good news. If you get behind, it's not that hard to catch up. I mean, even two weeks in, you're only one chapter behind. You'll be able to catch up pretty quickly. Ken, we got one up here. Right up front. All right, did we all do our reading and study this week? What did you discover? (laughs) <laughs> I heard there's a great chapter, there's a lot of psalms. Yeah, what do you notice about the, if you're reading out of this, what do you notice in all this writing here? It's a lot of bold. And remember, the bold are Old Testament references. And you've got to have another Bible to go look those up. This week there were a total of seven Old Testament passages. And I did a word count, so I copied this into Word and asked it how many words were there and what percentage of them were from the Old Testament. And it's about 70% of the words in just this portion of the chapter are Old Testament. So there was a lot of work. We just dove in feet first into the deep end of the pool. uh, And hopefully you found it a challenge and you may have some questions. We're going to walk through it bit by bit. Um, If you have a question, there's going to be an opportunity for you to ask that question. I just ask that you do it really loud and proud so uh, I can hear it and everyone can hear you. Uh, So grab your Bibles. We're going to start at the, actually where we left off last week, verse 4. It says, so he became superior. Who's he? Jesus. Jesus, talking about Jesus, became superior to the angels, just as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. So he's made this declaration that Jesus is what? superior to the angels, and now he has to prove that. Now, as you and I are sitting here, you may be thinking, why does he have to prove that? Is there any question in this room that Jesus is superior to angels? No. And so when we hear that, we may think, well, it seems like he's, he's instituting or beginning an argument that he doesn't need to institute. Anyone ever had a kid who's fighting over something, two kids fighting over things, and when you find out what it is, it's like, who gets the blue crayon? (laughs) And there's a box of 700 crayons with 13 different colors of blue, and they're arguing over the one? That's probably what this sounds like to us. it, It seems like a rhetorical question and issue that the author of Hebrews is bringing up, but it's not. In fact, in, in, the, in the day when this was written, this was a significant issue. Now, here's the problem, or the, the reason, at least, why we don't see it, is probably because we see angels like this, or like this, right? They're cute, they're chubby, they're Cupid-like. In fact, here they got... Uh, uh, in fact, when you look at this, what's your immediate response? Aww. Aww. See, this is awe-inspiring, but in a very different way. This is not how people in ancient Israel or when the writer of Hebrews is writing thought about the angels. And by the way, this is wrong. <laughs> this could not be any further from the truth of what angels are like. In, in the Hebrews' day, this is what they imagined. Yes. Or this is what they imagined. You, oh, that looks kind of like a, uh, like a super com- superhero comic book, right? Where do you think they got the idea? They stole it, is what they did. In fact, when you read through scripture, anytime someone has an encounter with an angel, their response is not awe. Their response is awe. 
I mean, these are celestial beings who are messengers sent from God to give a very specific declaration from God's mouth itself. So when people saw an angel and it was glowing, there's one exception to this in all of scripture, by the way. What is their response? Fear. They bow down in worship, right? With one exception. Who's the one exception? Mary. Mary sees an angel and she's like, okay, cool. <laughs> Shows you how awesome Mary is, right? It, 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 they instill this fear and awe. And that's, in fact, when you're looking at the writer of Hebrews and he's writing to these Jewish Christians with this background, one of the things that would happen in, in that culture is angels began to be revered and even worshipped. They had this elevated status. It was like God, angels, mankind. Okay? God, angels, mankind. And Jesus shows up on the picture, and they all knew him as what? As a man. Who then died, rose again, Right? And he's ascended to the Father, but that was kind of a new thing for them. Angels had been around for their entire history, the entire history of their people, and they had this elevated status. And these same Jewish Christians are facing immense pressure, which we're going to get to later in the book of Hebrews, to go back to the good old days. How many of you in the room would like to go back to the good old days? Yeah. When were those? The 80s? I get 80s, early 90s. See how easy it is for us to forget, right? Now, I grew up in the 80s and I loved the 80s, but things were messed up in the 80s. Don't get me started about the 60s. Hey, you know. The good old days are not all that they're cracked up to be, but when you're living in this day and age and you look back and you think, here's what really happens. We look back to when we had no responsibility, when we didn't have to adult, and that's what we're, wouldn't you all love to just stop adulting? Yeah. Oh man, it'd be glorious. It, one of the greatest moments of my life was when my kids came to me and said, um, I don't want to be an adult anymore. <laughs> and I said, I told you! I told you it was coming. So here's what's happening. Here's why this becomes important. Is it's important for the writer of Hebrews to make sure these Jewish Christians understand that Jesus is superior to the angels and everything else. And we're going to learn along with them. It does remind me a little bit of, um, I mean, you know what it means when I say the tail of the tape. What does that mean? You know, any boxing or MMA fans, right? So you get two boxers or two MMA fighters, and before the fight, they'll show you something like this. So I don't know if you know, Jake Paul and Mike Tyson in July are going to face off in an exhibition bout. And the tale of the tape tells you how these two fighters compare. Now, between these two fighters, uh, what's the age difference? 30 years. Uh, Tyson has a few more fights under his belt. Tyson has five times as many wins as Jake Paul does. Uh, he got a few more losses in there. Uh, 44 knockouts for Mike Tyson compared to six by Jake Paul. Of course, to be fair, six out of his uh, nine wins were by knockout. And by the way, what's Jake Paul really known for? He's a YouTuber turned professional boxer. Yeah, uh, he's a little taller than Mike Tyson. Uh, he's uh, about one stone less. Uh, I don't even know what a stone is, uh, but j here's what I know. Uh, Jake Paul weighs a little bit less than Mike Tyson. Now, if you were going to put money on this fight, who would you put money on? Tyson. Yeah, Tyson. I'm pretty sure Tyson's going to kill him. I hope Jake Paul's uh, life insurance is up to date. But, okay, this is, this is fun, but here's the real fight. Are you ready? Let me show you this tale of the tape. <laughs> all right, let's, let's pretend I was going to go into the ring with Mike Tyson. Well, first of all, the age gap shrunk, 
right? He's only four years older than I am. I have no fights, no wins, but also no losses. That's right. But no knockouts. I am a little bit taller than he is, assuming we're both telling the truth. Um, although I do weigh quite a bit more than Mike Tyson. Now, if you were putting money on this fight, who, 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 who would you, who? Mike Tyson? Have you read David and Goliath? Yeah? I mean, he comes at me with fists. I come at him with... I'm going to lie in the corner and cry is what I'm going to do. Right? So, but this tale of the tape shows you a comparison whether the fight is fair or not. And by the way, uh, without God's help, I'm a dead man. In fact, you know, they, 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 people ask this all the time. How much would it cost for you to get into the ring with Mike Tyson just once? And I'm like, well, I'll get into the ring. But do I have to fight him? If I have to fight him, I'm not sure that any amount of money is worth it because I am going to die. He hits me one time, it's all over. But this comparison reminds me of what the writer of Hebrews is doing here. In this next chapter, the rest of the chapter, he's going to prove that Jesus is superior to the angels. And we're going to look at this tale of the tape between the two. So grab your Bibles. We're going to be reading. And I need someone who is willing to come on up and read this chapter for me. I had someone lined up, but fell through. All right, Jason, come on up. That's fine. All right, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to read Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 through 14. Is that tall enough? It is not. Hebrews 1, beginning in verse 5. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son? Today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. Again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, And let all God's angels worship him. And about the angels, he says, He makes his angels winds and his servants a fiery flame. But to the son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. This is why God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy. Beyond your companions. And in the beginning, Lord, you established the earth. And the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like clothing. You will roll them up like a cloak. And they will be changed like clothing, but you are the same, and your years will never end. Now to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. Thank you, Jason. Have a seat. All right. So in this conversation of Jesus versus the angels, what approach does the author take? He does some comparisons. Right, you'll notice at the beginning, the first statement is what? What's he say at the very beginning? Verse 5. So to which of the angels did he ever say, and then he fill in the blank. Well, if you move to 13, he also says, now to which of the angels has he ever said, and he fills in the blank. So he begins with this kind of rhetorical question slash statement, and he ends with that same thing. What what, What the author is going to go about doing is showing, using the Old Testament, how what has been said about Jesus and what has been said about the angels. Let's compare what scripture, what God has said about Jesus, and then what God has said about the angels, and let's let's see which one of them wins in this tale of the tape, all right? So what is the first verse, first passage that gets brought up? You are my son, today I have become your father. What is that? Psalm 2-7. 
All right, so that is Psalm 2-7. Any questions about that as you read through Psalm 2-7? None? It appears he's talking to David. Yeah, and you're going to find out that there's, there's a lot of weird... When you read some of these, it's, you're, you're going to be like, uh, that doesn't sound like he's talking to Jesus, right? In fact, this psalm is a declaration that God has installed the king, right? Now, this is a passage that is in the moment speaking directly about King David... But remember, out of King David's line, there was a promise that his, his line would be established forever. And out of that line would come who? Jesus. Jesus, specifically, the Messiah. The Messiah would come out of his line and he would establish him as king. Now, this is fulfilled in Matthew 3, 7. So if you go look at Matthew 3, 7, you're going to see that this passage is, quote unquote, fulfilled. And it is also referenced by Paul in Acts 13, 32 through 33, when he's talking to the, in Antioch and giving a sermon there. And what both of those passages do is say, this psalm is specifically about Jesus. He says, you are my son, today I have become your father. Now, one of the questions that comes up is, how does he become his father? right? Because if, if you become something, that means you weren't that thing, right? And the answer is, that's a terrible translation. The word there is, is begotten, and it's, it's a difficult Greek or Hebrew word for us to translate. Uh, you'll remember it, he is the only begotten son, right? And this gets into a, a little bit of a mystery, because Jesus has been forever, and yet he had a moment where he was born. Both of those things are true. And it's hard for us in our finite minds to try and hold all of that together. But I want you to just put a pin in that because we're going to come back to it here in a second, all right? So he says, you're my son in, in Psalm 22, 7. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son, which is a quote out of 2 Samuel 7, 14 and also 1 Chronicles 17, 13, which is really the same passage. It's just in different places. It's the same thing. And this is Nathan talking to David after Israel finally has peace. And it is a prophetic look again to the, to the Davidic Messiah, that the Messiah is coming. It's very similar to this. What do these two verses say about Jesus? What's the overarching issue here? He's the son of God which means he is God. Amen. He is the son of God. Now, what about the angels, right? And again, when he brings his firstborn, it's the only time in the New Testament that's ever used, that word firstborn in reference to Christ. When he brings him, which is this begotten idea, into the world, what does he say? This is Deuteronomy 32, 43. What's he say? Let all God's angels... Worship him. Now, did anyone have trouble finding that in the Deuteronomy passage? Yes. Yeah. How come? <laughs> T Tanya raised her hand because we had a whole conversation about it. Was that on Wednesday? Yeah, so she's like, um, my Bible's broken. <laughs> That's not what she said. That's a paraphrase, right? What's, what's the deal? When you read Deuteronomy 32, 43, what's the problem? It's not there. Right? This phrase, let all God's angels worship him, is not there. Unless you look at the fine print, right? Which is a lesson for all of us. You got to go look at the little asterisk or the little letter or the little number in your Bible. And it's going to show you below. Here's the deal. Some of the earlier pass or versions of scripture, old, old ancient manuscripts, do not have that phrase. But when you get back to the Septuagint, and all the way back to some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, it shows up. Well, the writer of Hebrews is quoting it, so should it be there? Yeah, it absolutely should be there. But the real point is, what's it say about the angels? They will worship him. Well, if the angels are worshiping the Son, 
What does that say about the hierarchy? Yeah, the sun is higher. Yeah, you may have this elevated look at angels, but it, when it says the angels worshipped him, then the him is obviously higher than those. The one being worshipped is higher than the one doing the worshipping. Can we agree with that? Right, that's what he's saying. All right, and about the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his servants a fiery flame. How many of you read that and went, huh? I did. What does that mean? He makes his angels winds and his servants a fiery flame. This comes from Psalm 104.4. Anyone have an idea what that means? Yeah, he sends them like the wind or like fire. What are the angels? They're messengers and they're sent. Right? In this, this metaphor of wind and fire, uh, there's a couple things going on there. First of all, how did the ancient Israel mind, when they thought about how God uh, showed himself to them, how did that happen? In a cloud and in fire. The wind and in the fire. And he's saying, look, these angels are sent by God and they take on that form. Now, they're, they're sent to give a message from God. But again, just the fact that they are sent to give his message shows that they are messengers and servants. They're not the real deal. Well, they are the real deal. But they're not the one who's sending the message. Does that make sense? All right, so again... Who's higher, the messenger or the one who sends the messenger? The one who sends the messenger. All right? And I know we're, we're doing, we're, this feels like we're drinking from our fire hose. It's because we are, because I'm under the gun. All right? We've got a lot to cover here. All right, so next, verses 8 and 9, what is that a quote from? Psalm 45, 6 through 7. Now, this is a royal wedding song by the sons of Korah. And it, it, this is definitely one of those. When you read it, it's like, it doesn't immediately seem like a messianic reference, but it's more about God himself, right? Your throne, God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. Who's that talking about? That's God. You've loved righteousness, still talking about God, and you hated lawlessness. This is why God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy beyond your companions. Who has been anointed? Yeah, when you read the psalm, who's been anointed? The king. But now the writer of Hebrews is saying, again, this is about Jesus. This is a psalm about Jesus who has been anointed as king over God's kingdom. So if he's the king over God's kingdom, what does that make him? King of everything. He's been anointed. Jesus has been anointed. Have the angels been anointed to be kings? No. All right, now verses 10, 11, and 12. This is a quote from Psalm 102, 25 through 27. And by the way, man, there, there just seemed to be a lot in this chapter, right? Well, the good news is uh, this is about as bad as it gets, but there are more times coming up when we're going to read through the Old Testament. Psalm 102 is a psalm of lament for a weak and suffering person. It is a cry to God for help when you read the psalm as a whole. But at the end of the psalm, verses 25 through 27, the second half of this focuses on God's strength and his power to help those of us who are not strong. But I want you to read this and listen. Think about this psalm with the Messiah in mind. He says, In the beginning, Lord, you established the earth. And the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. So what's going on there? What's the theme? What's that? Not the end of the earth. The beginning. All right, it says, you, in the beginning, you established the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hand. Who created the earth and the heavens? God did. In the very beginning. But then he says, they will perish... But you will remain. You remain. They will wear out like clothing, and you'll roll them up like a cloak, and they will be changed like clothing. 
but you are the same. Anyone ever had go into your closet and realize that you're, well, let's talk about, guys, we're going to talk about this for a second. (laughs) My favorite shirt in the whole world, I'm not allowed to wear anymore. Why am I not allowed to wear this shirt anymore? Because it has holes in it. It's my holy shirt. I love that shirt. Because it's comfortable. Why does my wife hate that shirt? Because it's comfortable. No, nah, because it's worn out. It needed to be retired a long time ago. Guys, I know I'm not the only one in the room, right? Right? Everyone got that favorite shirt that you're not allowed to wear unless she's not there? Yeah, yeah. I think you got rid of one of my shirts, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She fixed one of my favorite shirts once. Oh, I was furious. How dare you, right? Clothing wears out. And that's the metaphor that's being used here. Look, yes, God created everything, but it's in decline. It's breaking down. But he says, you will remain forever. And by the way, the world was created through Christ and he is established for all time. We are temporary. We're breaking down. Don't I know it? I hurt my wrist the other day and I couldn't tell you why. I'm pretty sure it's because I slept wrong. How many of you have gotten injured sleeping? Right. Notice no one under 40 raised their hands. Yeah. But you are the same. Your years will never end. There's this link between God, the eternal creator, and Christ, the eternal creator. Remember, all of this is about Jesus. He's proving that Jesus is greater than the angels. And he finishes in verse 13. Now to which of the angels has he ever said, and this is a Psalm 110 quote, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. God, Jesus ascends to heaven and what does he do? He sits down. But it's not that he's doing nothing. He's doing a lot of stuff, right? He's still ruling. He is reigning. And that's what this passage, that's what the author here is saying. Yes, he's sitting at the right hand of God, but he's still doing things. And by the way, what do the angels do? What is their posture in the presence of God? Do they sit? No, they do one of two things. They stand in worship or they bow in worship. They never sit. They are never shown sitting in all of scripture. But Jesus sits at the right hand of God because he is God. And his enemies, yes, the world is breaking down, but at some point his enemies will be put under his footstool. At some point, we, we like, I, I said it this week, I think in our men's group, we read the back of the book and guess what happens? See, and I say this all the time, but it's actually not the right way to say it. I say, we win. He wins. How old are you? Seven. Seven-year-olds, got it. He wins. God wins. We can look right now and say, yeah, he won, right? On the cross, he won. But death still reigns, right? But that is coming to an end. There will be no more tears. There will be no more pain. There will be no more death. There will be no more sorrow. At the end, God wins. Jesus ultimately wins. All right, so what do we do with all this? All of this is about one thing. Jesus is greater than the angels. When we look at this passage, these passages, what we're really dealing with, and this is something very different than how we typically approach this conversation. When we talk about Jesus in our modern culture, when Christians talk about Jesus, we very often start by talking about what Jesus did, right? What did Jesus do? We talk at Easter. What did Jesus do? Hasn't been that long ago. He died and rose again. He came to write from Christmas to Easter. 
We're talking all about what Jesus did. He came. He was born in a manger. He lived his life. He did some miraculous things. But ultimately, he died. He was buried. He rose again. He ascended to heaven. And then he's coming back. Isn't that awesome? But that is not what the author of Hebrews begins with. Now, he's going to be talking about those things. But he starts with an important question, an important answer to a question I don't, I'm not sure we ask very often. He's answering the question, who is Jesus? Who is he and why does he matter? And there's an important reason why the author talks about who Jesus is. I want you to listen to this quote by N.T. Wright on this passage. It says, once you see who the son really is, and the role he was intended to play in God's plan, you won't go back to anything or anyone else. And remember, at the very beginning, I said these Jewish Christians were under intense pressure to go back to the good old days, to elevate angels, to let Jesus go. Jesus is one guy, right? How many angels are there? A bunch. Definitely more than one. Right? I mean, you can name more than one angel. Name, name a few. Michael, Gabriel. Do we got two? What's that? Yeah, Lucifer. He ain't wrong. All right. Uh, in fact, we talk about all the time. Yeah. That uh, how many of the angels fell? A third of them fell. All right. So the good news is it's two to one. So our angels outnumber the demons, right? Doesn't that give you some? Doesn't that make you feel good about the world? Yeah. Here's here's what I want to tell you. I say this all the time, and this is what the writer of Hebrews is driving at. If all of the angels had fallen, they're still outnumbered by the one. They're still outnumbered by Jesus. Yes, it's two to one, but it doesn't matter. Jesus is greater than all of them combined. And there's intense pressure for these Jewish Hebrews, Jewish Christians, to come back to this idea that the angels are great, they're amazing. It's what we've known our whole lives. But the author of Hebrews is trying to elevate Jesus and say, the angels in the grand scheme of things do not matter. It's like Pastor David stepping into the ring with Mike Tyson. They're dead. In fact, you talk about reading the back of the book, right? And and, and we love when you read Revelation. And by the way, if you ever come to me and say, can we do a study on Revelation? There's a very simple answer. No. You can do it, but I'm not going to do it because it just, and there's a reason. You should study the book of Revelation, and I have done it, but here's the thing. You start studying the book of Revelation, all these weird things come out of the woodworks, right? And we love to talk about the battle of Armageddon, right? What's going to happen at the battle of Armageddon? Right, there's a battle. There's the, the enemies of God on this side and the heaven's armies on this side. And it reminds us of every every epic battle scene and every movie you've ever seen, right? This is where Lord of the Rings gets it. And by the way, I'm not even being facetious there. J.R.R. Tolkien, who is a great friend of C.S. Lewis, he's getting these ideas from Scripture. It's the greatest battle of good versus evil. Here's the difference. In the movie, what happens next, right? You got the good guys on this side, the bad guys on this side. What happens next? They meet in the middle. There's this huge clash, right? And I think we get this idea that that's what happens at the end of Revelation. That is not what happens. You get the bad guys on this side and the good guys on this side and God says, I win. (laughs) And that's it. God says, this is over. Why? Because Jesus won the battle there. We're just waiting a little bit for that victory to take hold, for Jesus Jesus to come back and establish his rule once and for all. 
So here's who Jesus is. As we look through these verses, verses 5 through 7, we talked about this. He is the Son of God. He's divine. He is worshipped by the angels who are His messengers and His servants. He's the Son of God. Jesus is the anointed King. He is anointed by God as the ruler of His kingdom. He is the only anointed one. So He is God. He is anointed. In verses 10 through 11, He is the eternal creator. He created the world and will replace it when the time comes. By contrast, He is eternal and forever. Do you know that we get a new earth? I think sometimes we think, man, this world is is just, it's just crumbling around us. It's falling apart. And that is true. But the good news is when this earth expires, we get a brand new one. New and improved. A new heaven and a new earth, and a new kingdom, and who is the king over that kingdom? Jesus is, which is what is said in verse 13. He is reigning today, and he will reign for all time. Right? We talk about the thousand-year reign, and we can argue over when that happens or how that happens, but Jesus reigns for more than a thousand years. Jesus has reigned over God's kingdom since before the earth was created and he will reign long after this earth is gone. He is reigning. He sits at God's right hand until the course of time comes to end, put the end to all of his enemies. Listen to Doug Wilson's quote. I think this is good. Christ is not sitting there to rest or to recuperate, but to reign. What is the right hand of God but the place of all authority? And if Christ was the agent of creation, what will he do as the agent of recreation? Christ is reigning now and he will continue to reign until his will is fully accomplished. In other words, while Christ is seated there before his return, all his enemies, with death the only exception, will be subdued to him. This will be through the means that he ordained, which is the preaching of the gospel. Which again is the point here. Should we be talking about angels or Jesus? Jesus. In fact, that's kind of the final point here. Look at verse 14. We're going to close with this. Are they not all? Who's the are they? The angels. Not all ministering spirits sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation? Well, who are those who are going to inherit salvation? Us. So who are the angels sent to serve? Us. They are messengers and servants to God's church. They minister to us. They encourage us. They strengthen us. But they serve us. And in turn, right, where does this preaching of the gospel happen? Does it happen? Do the angels do it? Uh Uh-uh. That's us. They serve us. They give us God's message. We serve the world and give the world God's gospel. Jesus reigns. He is the Son of God. And here's what I want you to know. Here's why this is important. You and I may not have any qualms about whether Jesus is bigger than the angels. He is. But I want you to know this. Jesus is bigger than anything you've got going on in your life. Jesus is bigger and greater than anything going on in the world. When you hear about stuff going on in the Middle East, yeah, it's concerning. It's something we should pay attention to, but it is not, listen to me, it is not something we should be afraid of. There is an election coming up this November. I do not know who's going to win. Here's what I do know. I know one thing. It's going to be a mess. It's going to be a mess, no matter what. And half of our nation is going to be angry and think that something was stolen. And the other half is going to be happy and be thumbing their noses at those who lost and saying, get up and grow up. Get over it and grow up, right? And I don't care which side of that you're on. Here's what I know. No matter how November is going to come out, Jesus is still on the throne. 
He is still reigning. We don't have to be afraid of what's going to happen in November. Regardless, I can tell you. I remember my first election. How many of you remember the first time you voted? Yeah, I remember I voted, and the guy I voted against won. And I thought, I was, I think I was 19 at the time, I thought the world was coming to an end. I thought it was over. How could we as a nation? I was so disappointed in America. And I've been disappointed many times since. And I will be disappointed many times over from this point forward. But here's what I've learned. They're not in control. They're not in control. Jesus is in control. God is in control. God is in control in your life. So no matter what's going on in your life, take this lesson of Hebrews to heart. And I want to show you a little, a little, a new equation. I, I'm terrible at math. Where are my math people in the room? People who like math. You weirdos. Here's a math equation. Who can read that? Oh, are you sure? Are you sure? Yeah, all right. Because you've been batting a thousand so far. I don't want to see you mess up your average. Who can read it? Will. Yeah, almost. Yeah. The therefore mathematical symbol has the dot on the top. This one has the dot on the bottom. Anyone know what it means? It means because. Jesus is greater than the angels because Jesus is God. And it's important that you and I realize that Jesus is God. He's not, and as a pastor and as a Christian, it drives me crazy anytime I hear this. Jesus was a great teacher and a great prophet and a great human being. No, Jesus was the Son of God, God Himself, who came in flesh and blood to die for you and me. And He is sitting at the right hand of God, and He is sending out His angels to minister to His church, and He is sending us into the world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's stand and pray. Jesus, I am so thankful that you are greater. You are greater than any challenge we face. You are greater than anything going on in the world. You are greater than any political system. You are greater than any challenge, physical, financial, any job problems we have, family problems we have. And Father, that doesn't minimize the challenges and and terrible things going on around the world. But we know that there is a day coming when you will return and set all things right, when everything will be put under your footstool. And until that moment, we are called to be messengers of the gospel to a lost and dying world. Father, may we take that responsibility seriously. And understand that we have been given that charge. That that is not what the angels do. It is what we are sent to do in a broken and dying world. But we do that knowing that you sit at the right hand of the Father. That you are reigning here and now and are reigning for all of eternity. And you are coming back to set everything right. To give us a new heaven and a new earth with no more tears and no more crying and no more sorrow, no more elections, no more drones, no more bombs. It's all going to be done with. And we will live and reign with you for all of eternity. Father, help us when we're going through the challenges and difficulties in our own life to remember that you are greater because you are God. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Have a seat real quick. Got a couple quick announcements, then you're dismissed. Good morning. Did you say quick? Okay.